Wolf, Ruben, welcome to Talk Python to me. Hello. Hello. Thanks for having hello, us. Hello. Yeah, it's great to have you here. We're going to dive into packaging once again. And we, we've talked about packaging a couple times over the last few months. It's, it's a super interesting topic. And there are these times where it seems like there's a there's a fixed way and everyone kind of agrees like this is how you do things um, for example you know think flask and django have kind of been web frameworks for a long time then all of a sudden you know a thousand flowers bloom and there's a bunch of new ideas in in the web space i think that was driven by async and the typing stuff and a bunch of people said well let's let's try new things now that we have these new ideas and the other frameworks were more stable couldn't make those adjustments and I think people are just, you know, it, we're kind of at one of these explosion points of different different ideas and different experiments in packaging. What do you all think? Uh, yeah, I think that's uh, that's an interesting way to put it. I think uh, we definitely see a lot of interest in package management these days and mm -hmm. uh, new ideas being explored. Um, but I also think that we're definitely standing on the shoulders of giants, so kind of similar to what you just described with the web frameworks where actually I think we are taking a lot of inspiration from multiple different ecosystems that are out there and try to kind of synthesize the best ideas yeah. uh, into well, our tools. Yeah, you got some interesting ideas for sure. <laughs> Ruben? I cannot really add to that anymore. I'm uh, standing <laughs> on the shoulders of giants <laughs> like Wolf. So yeah, absolutely. I think we'll go into that. <laughs> yeah, we sure will. Now, before we get into the topics, let's just do a quick introduction for folks who don't know you. I feel like uh, this is a really interesting uh, coincidence because the very last previous show that I did was with um, Sylvan and Jeremy, a bunch of folks from QuantStack. Nice. And, <laughs> you know, yeah. just out of coincidence, like I said, uh, your colleagues, <laughs> right? So, Wolf, let's start with you, a little background on you. Sure. Uh, yeah, so I did work at QuantStack for quite a while. Um, and it's also where my journey with package management began, but uh, maybe just taking one more step back. Uh, I studied in Zurich and I actually graduated in robotics there, um, with a master's wow. degree and yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. I had some fun times. Uh, we, I was also working with Disney research on like a little robot that was drawing images in the sand and these kind of uh, fun things. But, uh, at Quantstack, we were doing a lot of scientific computing stuff, initially trying to like re-implement NumPy in C++, which is a library called Xtensor, and always doing a lot of package management and mostly in the Conda Forge and Conda ecosystem. And Conda at some point became really slow and Conda Forge became really large. <laughs> and that led me to kind of experiment with new things, which resulted in Mamba. And uh, then I got really lucky and had the opportunity to create my own uh, little startup around more of these package management ideas, which is the current company called Prefix. And we'll dive more into Pixie and these, all these new things that we're doing, I think, later on. Yeah, that's a lot of interesting stuff. What language do you program a robot that writes in the sand in? <laughs> it's always a mix of Python and C++. So I think I stuck <laughs> to that up until now. Yeah, yeah, it sounds like it. Ruben, what's your story? Tell people a bit about it. Yeah, yourself. so uh, I also started in robotics. I did a mechatronics engineering de uh, degree. And uh, while working in robotics, I started uh, at my previous company, Smart Robotics. And there we uh, were building the new uh, modern uh, AI-driven robots. So uh, that also involves a lot of deep learning packages and stuff like that. And that is kind of how I got into these package management solutions. And uh, we started using Conda uh, to package our uh, C++ and our Python stuff uh, mm -hmm. and to make it easy to use in, in these virtual environments uh, where we combine those packages. And it all was made easier by Mamba, which was uh, built by Wolf. So that's how we got in touch. And uh, later on, I uh, moved to Wolf's company. So uh, that's why I'm here now. Excellent. So you're a, a prefix dev as well. Yes. Awesome. And uh, next for dev there. Yep. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, let's. I guess let's start with a little bit of um, 
maybe setting the stage. So you all talked about Conda and Conda Forge and really relying on that for a while and then you know, wanting better performance, some other features we're going to talk about as well. But give us a, a quick background for those maybe non-data scientists or people who are not super into it. Uh, what is Conda and what is Conda Forge and the relationship of those things? Who wants to take that? Yeah. Um, so Conda is, a, generally speaking, a package manager. Like That's all it is. It actually has nothing specific to AI, ML, data science, etc. But most people associate it with Python and uh, machine learning, let's say. Um, and uh, Conda is written in Python and it's like, I don't know, 10 or 15 years old. Um, and it kind of uh, comes out of an era where there was no, there were no wheel files on PyPI and people had to compile stuff on their own machines. Right. Was no you can't use this. Support. Where's your Fortran compiler? Come on. You're like, yeah, oh, exactly. what? What year is this again? <laughs> <laughs> and you need your GCC, etc. So yeah. uh, that's kind of when Conda was born. And I think it really like was one of those early tools that uh, tried something with binary package management cross-platform. So basically Conda allowed you to install Python and a bunch of uh, Python uh, uh, packages that needed compiled extensions like NumPy, SciPy, etc. And it kind of comes out of this uh, Travis Oliphant universe mm -hmm. of uh, scientific Python tools. Yeah, he's made a huge impact for sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, but for us, sort of the key feature is just that it's like a cross-platform generic package manager that you can actually use for any language. So you can also uh, create Conda packages for R, and there are actually quite a few uh, R packages for, for on Conda Forge, let's say. And uh, you can also do Julia or Rust, etc. So, so there's a lot of possibility and potential. And uh, I think it also kind of hits a sweet spot where Conda is really not a language-specific package manager. Um, and it's at the same time cross-platform because usually what you have is you have either like uh, some sort of like Windows package manager or Linux package manager like apt-get or DNF on Fedora or you have like a language specific package manager like pip or Julia has package.jl or mm -hmm. uh, I don't know R has cran etc and so Conda kind of sits uh, at the crossroads of those two where it's not language specific and also cross-platform and I think that makes it uh, like really interesting and then maybe I can also uh, talk a little bit about Conda Forge because I think that's yeah. the other really Im impactful part of, about the Conda universe where Conda Forge is really a group of, I think, over 5,000 individual people that are building packages in uh, GitHub repositories. And each of those repositories basically builds a recipe on a CI system that then kind of results in in the artifact, which is a Conda package that you can install. And so all of the packages on Conda Forge are, yeah, are built on CI systems. And the, um, most of them are like cross-platform available. So you have them for Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. And those packages are like all the low-level stuff. Like usually Conda starts at the glibc level, let's say. So glibc is like that fundamental library that we, we need to get from, from the operating system. And on Windows and Mac OS, there's like an SDK and other like DLLs that we need from the operating system. But everything above is like managed by, by Conda or Mamba or Pixie. So uh, all of these tools work with, uh, on the base of the same packages. And that starts at like bzip2 or zlib, like these low level compression libraries, uh, OpenSSL, and then up to Python. And then you can also uh, get Qt which is a graphical user interface library, which is written in C++. Um, and applications that are building on top of Qt, so like, for example, physics simulation engines and stuff like this. So, and you also get CUDA and uh, lots of libraries like this. Uh, and it's uh, all is not bound to like a specific operating system in that sense. And um, that makes it pretty, pretty nice. For example, also yeah. in CI, when you want to test your own software and stuff like this, you can use the same commands to set up basically the same packages across different, um, yeah, 
platforms. Yeah, nice. Yeah, so kind of like what Wheels did for Pip and PyPI, Conda was way yeah. ahead of that game, right? Um, but with a harder challenge because it wasn't just Python packages, it was all these different ones, right? Yeah. Yeah, including Python itself. So that's also one of the things that people sometimes maybe not realize, but Python itself is actually properly packaged on Conda Forge and installable via Conda or Mamba or Pixie. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Ruben, anything you want to add to that before we start talking about what you all are creating? Yeah, so from my history, it's like this multi-platform stuff is less used in robotics because a lot of the stuff is still running in uh, Linux, uh, but it moved it from the ability to run it only on Ubuntu to yeah, any version you want. And you could install any version of the role software, uh, the robotic software you're running on like any version of Ubuntu. So where we were locked, not just to Linux, but locked to a distribution of Linux, we were now like completely unbound and the developers can yeah, set up their own environments, which is just really powerful for the user itself. And uh, that brought it back into our company in a much better way. Yeah. That's excellent. I'm always blown away at how much traffic these package managers have, you know, how much bandwidth they use and things like that. Yeah. Who's hosting Conda Forge and where you get, where you get yeah. that stuff from? Uh, so currently Conda Forge is entirely hosted by anaconda.org. Uh, we do have a couple of mirrors available. But they are not uh, really used. But uh, one of the more exciting mirrors that we have is on GitHub itself. GitHub has this GitHub packages feature, and uh, we are using an OCI registry uh, where you would usually put your like Docker containers and stuff like that. Uh, we upload all the content packages there uh, just as a backup. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're planning to make it usable as well. So that would be nice for like your own GitHub actions and stuff because they could just like take the packet from sort of GitHub internal. Right, just uh, just write down the, the, the server rack in the data center. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Keep it local. It's always good to be local. Yep. Okay, cool. So let's, uh, I want to focus mostly on Pixie for our conversation because I think that's got a lot of excitement. Maybe we'll get some time to talk about Mamba and other things as well. Sure. But yeah, let's, you, you all wrote this interesting uh, announcement in, entitled Let's Stop Dependency Hell, talking about <laughs> Pixie here. And so it's, I think we can just sort of talk through some of the ideas you laid out there and that'll give people a good idea of, of what this is all about. Yeah, good. Yeah. So first of all, let's start with some of the problems you're trying to solve here. So say so we've all experienced issues with reproducibility and dependency management. I will tell you just yesterday and if it was later in the day for me it would probably be today i'm running into a problem where with my courses website where i try to install both the developer dependencies and the production dependencies mm -hmm. and it it's like this one requires greater than this dependency and this one requires less than that dependency you can't install it i'm like well how, how am i supposed to do this like i'd rather have it shaky yeah. than impossible so <laughs> You know, it's dependency challenges are, are all too present for yeah. me. But yeah, let's let's uh, maybe you can uh, lay out some of the some of the ideas, like what you had in mind when you're talking about reproducibility and, and challenges here. Yeah, I think you're not alone, first of all. So a lot of people have these kind of problems. Uh, and it's also not uh, only in the Python world, let's say. But I think it's maybe a bit more pronounced in the Python world, just because there are so many packages and the way that package management in the Python world works. But, yeah, I feel like we can uh, always look over at the JavaScript. People feel a little bit yeah. better, but it's still a challenge for us. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, yeah. Um, so, well, we are, in, with Pixie, uh, just to take one step back. So um, we kind of started to, again, rewrite the entirety of like how you manage Conda packages. Um, with uh, Pixie or with the lower level tools that we're using in Pixie, which are called, it's like a set of crates that is under the Redla repository. And 
those are like i don't know eight or nine crates that basically do everything from like fetching the package resolving the versions that you want to have reading the metadata from the packages and uh, linking it into the virtual environment because we're creating these virtual environments on the on the hard drive and we have a central cache and things like this and so rattler is kind of the low level tools that take care of all of this and it's written more or less from scratch in rust I mean, obviously we're reusing a lot of the nice things that we found in the Rust ecosystem. So there are many very useful crates. But um, yeah, basically that's that's sort of the bottom line thing that we're doing. And what's also nice about it is that we are spinning off multiple uh, things from the same set of crates. So it's not only Pixie, there's also one thing called Rattler Build, which is actually building the Conda packages. And there is another, and then we have the backend of our website, prefix.dev which is also written in Rust and also uses Vettler underneath. So that's really nice for us. So and maybe if I was, uh, if I wanted to stick with say Conda, could I still use Rattler build and then somehow upload yeah. that to uh, Conda Forge, something Definitely. along those lines? Yeah. Okay. You can totally like, that's kind of the uh, baseline uh, sort of commonality between all of these tools is that we are sharing the same sort of Conda packages and the same metadata and like, uh, uh, yeah, we definitely want to be 100% compatible package-wise with Conda for now. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Uh, we might have features later on, but we uh, like we don't like we want to go through like Conda as a project has also like become much more community-oriented, and there is like a process called Conda enhancement proposals, and we we have already written a few of those, so there are many ideas, but. Uh, we can talk about that later. Yeah, try um, trying to improve the overall system instead of overthrow yes, it. Yes. Yeah? Yes. Yeah, like we we would love to like uh, improve the entirety of like Conda packages, Conda Forge, and all of this. Like that's that's our main dream. Um, but uh, yeah, so what? So and then with some of the low level tools in Redline with Pixie, we're kind of combining a bunch of tools that already existed. And one thing essential for reproducibility is that you have log files. So at the point where you are sort of resolving your um, your dependencies, we are also writing them into a log file, and that's like something known from poetry, from npm, mm -hmm. yarn, uh, cargo also has it. And there's also a Conda project that's called Conda Log that uh, writes log files. And so we have adopted the same format that Conda Log uses, which is a YAML based log file format, and uh, implemented in Rattler, and we are exposing it and using it in Pixie. So anytime you like add a new dependency to your project, we write it in a log file and um, we make sure that like you can install the same uh, packages, the same set of packages, the same versions and SHA hashes uh, in uh, like the future. And the other part about reproducibility, and that's more on the uh, repository side, is that Conaforge never deletes old packages. So uh, that's similar to PyPI, but not really this like it's different in a lot of like Linux distributions, but uh, with PyPI, it's also the case that, you know, old versions are just kept around. Do you ever worry that that might not be sustainable? <laughs> like it's, it's fine like, now in 20 yeah. years of like, we cannot pay for the thing from 20 years. <laughs> like it's, <laughs> we just can't get a donation, enough donations to support Flask 0 0.1. We just can't, <laughs> <laughs> it's out. Yeah. I mean, Sure. Like that's the problem of the person that uses Flask 0.1, right? Like, <laughs> that's not the problem of the repository. I think we're no, just no, sure, sure. you could, you could still run it and you should probably sandbox it like crazy. So that, uh, there are no like zero days that could affect your system. Well, also uh, you, you do have some things that are, um, like self-hosted Conda capabilities that maybe we'll get a chance to talk about. Like theoretically you could, you could download these and save as a, a company or an organization or a researcher. You could get the ones that actually count for you, right? Yeah. Like, you I mean, only have a subset of the packages that you need? Yeah. Say I'm using 50 packages with the transitive closure of everything I'm using. And so yeah. I'm just going to make sure I have every version of those on Dropbox or on a hard drive I put, put away somewhere. Yeah. It's actually yeah. pretty funny. Because what you create on your local system is a cache of all the packages that you ever used. 
and you could activate that cache as a channel, like what Condor Forges, you could make your own right. channel of all your packages right. locally. This is something we used when uh, internet went down in our company, and we still needed okay. to share packages with each other. <laughs> yeah. We needed to make our environments, and just some people would spin up their own channel, and you could use it from there. It's just a different Oh, awesome. Era. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Cool. I, I derailed your... <laughs> You're uh, <laughs> no, no. there, Wolf. No, but yeah, I think like log files are the basis for reproducibility, uh, and then the, the the fact that packages are never deleted, um, and um, I think that's something that like log files make uh, it look a little bit like a Docker container, sort of. Yeah. Um, because you know exactly what's in your software environment. We don't control the outside and we don't do sandboxing as of now. Um, but that's kind of the way we think about log files. And it just makes it very convenient also to ship uh, basically that log file plus the pixie toml and stuff to your coworker and they can just run it. And we also resolve for multiple operating systems at the same time. So you can say, you can specify in your pixie toml. If you want Linux, Mac OS and Windows, and we resolve everything at the same time in parallel with async Rust code and stuff like this. Nice. So it's pretty fast and nice. And uh, yeah, the idea is that you can send it to your coworker. They can just do a pixie run start, which, uh, which will just give them everything they need and um, have them up and going. Yeah, really cool. So in your announcement for pixie, one of the things you said is you're looking for the convenience of modern package managers such as cargo yeah. what's different than say pip and pypi versus cargo like yeah. when you say that what are these new features you're like i wish we had this already we don't so i'm going to build it so uh with i think one thing that's just really nice with cargo is and that also attracts so many contributors to Rust project, at least like that's the way I feel about it, is that it's so easy to just say uh, cargo run whatever, and it uh, most of the time works and you just do cargo build and like it builds. And um, that's the experience that we want to recreate with Pixie. And cargo also comes with log files and cargo um, just does this pretty, pretty nicely. I mean, there are some peculiarities about how how Rust builds packages or thinks about dependencies where the result is pretty different, let's say from like Python ecosystem and stuff like this. But uh, the baseline experience is definitely what we're also striving for. Mm -hmm. And part of the problem is maybe also that pip is not managing Python. So you always have that a little bit of a chicken and egg problem where you need to get Python yeah. first to be able to run pip. And with Pixie, you don't have that problem because we also manage Python. So you can specify in your Pixie Tommy what version of Python you want. You get it on Windows, Mac OS, and Linux in the same way. And everything is just one command. And it's everything is also locked in your log file, etc. So that's kind of, um, yeah, we just control a bit more uh, than pip. Um, and I think that's, that's what's giving us some power. And then pip also... Like as far as I'm aware, and we recently had discussions with uh, Python uh, or Python package management developers, uh, they haven't come up with a log file format that works for everyone yet. So Poetry has their own implementation, and a bunch of other tools maybe have their own implementation. Right, as there's well. the pip lock from pip env and others. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But um, yeah, so we're also kind of working on that. I don't know if you saw that, but we just announced another tool that's also low level, sort of on the same level as Rattler, but it's called RIP. And it deals with Python resolving and wheel files. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so we want to kind of cross over those two worlds where we resolve the Conda packages first, and we resolve the Python packages after, and we stick everything into the same log file that will for now be similar to the, yeah, basically uh, based on the Conda log format, which is a YAML file. Interesting. So this rip, uh, I'm familiar with it. I didn't necessarily, in my mind, tie it back to Pixie. Yeah. But so, would that allow you to, could you mix and match? Like some stuff comes off Conda Forge and some stuff comes off of PyPI, but you express that in your dependency file? Yeah, uh, like there, 
parts of the semantics are, aren't yet figured out, let's say. But uh, the idea is definitely that you can install Python and NumPy, for example, from ConvaForge, and then, I don't know, scikit-learn from uh, PyPI. Like, wow. that's maybe not the example of how you would use it, but... Yeah, of course, right. Maybe you do have one of the web frameworks, right? Like Fast API yeah. versus uh, some sure. of the scientific stuff from um, Conda. Yeah. Yeah, I find the, at least the official Conda stuff, sometimes the framework, certain frameworks are a little bit behind. And there are situations where having the latest one within an hour matters a lot. Uh, yeah. You know, for example, hey, it turns out, theoretically, it's not real. It turns out that, say, Flask has a super bad remote code execution problem. Uh, we just found out that if you send, like, a cat emoji as part of the URL, it's all over. So patch it yeah. now, right? Like, you don't want to wait for that to, like, slowly get through some... Pro you need that now, right? In, in PyPI, I find... Um, it's kind of the the tip of the the latest uh, in that regard. Yeah. So I I do agree to some extent. So it's uh, like we also found that a lot of um, there are these no arch packages like pure Python packages, and I think and there's just way more packages on PyPI, and the churn of yeah. managing that on Conda Forge is a bit high. So that's also like we have. Lots of reasons, and also in real world examples, we often find people mixing PyPI, PIP, and uh, Conda. So that's why we're thinking like we need proper <laughs> sort of support for PyPI in our tool to make it really nice for Python developers. Yeah, it, it would um, take it to another level for sure, and it would certainly make it stand yeah. out from what Conda does or what PIP does, honestly. Yeah, and like Conda, for example, they there is a way to kind of like add some Python dependency or PIP dependencies, but it's really just invoking PIP. Uh, as like a sub process and then installing some additional stuff into your environment. And it's not really nice, not really tightly integrated. And so we actually kind of took, did the work and wrote a, a resolver in Rust, so SAT solver. And uh, we've just uh, extended it to also deal with Python or PyPI metadata, mm -hmm. which oh, is cool. kind of what RIP is. Yeah, so that's going to be very interesting uh, t uh, to, to figure out how to integrate those things and like really make them work nicely together. Yeah, I want to talk about the ergonomics using Pixie, but first, uh, you know, um, Baby Ruben, you could address this first, but I, I opened this whole conversation with uh, a thousand flowers blooming around the, the package management story. And I think for a long time, what people had seen was they're going to try to innovate within Python. So you install Python, you create your environment, and then like you have a different workflow with different tools. But they're starting, some of the new ideas are starting to move to the outside. Like we'll also manage Python itself. If you say you want Python 3.10 and you only have 3.11 installed, we'll take care of that. And something built on Python has a real hard time installing python because there's this yeah. chicken and egg probably it needs it first right and it sounds like you all are taking that approach of we're going to be outside of python you know built in rust or any binary that just runs on its own would work to yeah, exactly. have, a, have a greater control right so um yeah i know just what are your thoughts on that yeah so the one of the strong points is pixie that you can install it as a standalone binary so you have a simple script or you can even just download it and uh, put it in your machine and then you can install whatever you want. So you're not limited to Python alone. And in a lot of cases, you want to mix a lot of stuff. Some, some, sometimes you need a specific version of uh, SSH or sometimes you need a specific version of OpenSSL or whatever that needs your package. And you would have these long lists of uh, getting started uh, to like, oh, you need to install this with APT or you need to install this with name anything. Uh, any other package manager, and then you can run pip install, and then it should all work. And Pixie kind of moves that back to you have to have Pixie, mm -hmm. and you have to have the source code of the package that you're running, or you're directly like using Pixie to install something. And like you're most of the time just two commands away from running the actual code that you're trying to run, instead of yeah. going to read some kind of uh, readme from a person on the internet. Yeah, and it's also pretty challenging for newcomers 
to programming. Yes, exactly. You're this like, really I, I just want to run easy. this. <laughs> I just, yeah, exactly. I just want to yeah. run this. You're like, but what am I doing all this terminal stuff? Like, I just want to run. <laughs> I wrote the program. I want it to go. Uh, I feel like maybe that's that's part of why notebooks and that whole notebooks Jupiter side of things is so popular because, like, assuming somebody has created a server and got it started for you, like you don't worry about those yeah. things, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So let's talk about um, kind of the that that beginner experience. If you have an example on your website somewhere where. It just shows if you just check out a repository that's already been configured to use Pixie, it's just clone Pixie run, is it run start or something like that, right? You don't have to create the environments and even that, that could potentially happen without Python even on the machine initially, right? Totally. Yeah, so funny part of Pixie is we, Pixie itself is a Pixie project. So <laughs> if we want to build Pixie, it is a Rust project, but we run Pixie run build in this case, yeah. or Pixie yeah. install, Pixie run install. So mm -hmm. you kind of uh, move everything back into the tasks in Pixie and you can uh, you can run it using Pixie. And Pixie will nice. take care of your environment. Yeah, so basically, as I also said before, we are learning a lot, for example, from Cargo. So we also have a mm -hmm. single Pixie Toml file that kind of defines all of your dependencies, a okay. bit of metadata about your project. And then you can define these tasks. And so like what we see on the screen is that we have a task that's called start and that just runs Python main.py. So that's pretty straightforward, but obviously, uh, like you can go further, like you can have tasks that depend on other tasks and there we're learning a lot from, there's a project called taskfile.dev. Um, and, uh, we also want to integrate caching into these tasks so that if you like one task might download something on your system, like some assets that you need, like images and stuff. And if you already have them cached, then you don't need to redownload them and these kind of things. So we're really like wanting to build a simple, but powerful task system in there. And that benefits greatly from having these dependencies available so, because like in this case, what we see on the screen, we have the dependencies and one of those is Python 3.11. And that means at the moment you run Pixie run start, it will actually look at the log file and look at what you have in your local environment installed. And the environments are always local to the project, which is also a difference to Conda and Mamba. Uh, so it will look into that environment and check if Python 3.11 is there. And if the version that you have in your environment corresponds to the one that's uh, listed in the log file. And if not, it will download the version and install it into your environment and like make sure that you have all the stuff that's necessary uh, or listed, um, to run your, to run what you need. Nice. So for example, you got in your example, uh, Python 3.11.4 with some flexibility there on the very, very end. Yeah. Uh, does that download a binary version or does it build from source or what happens when it needs that? Yeah. So typically, uh, like Conda is a binary package manager. So usually what you download is binary. Yeah, we're working on the source uh, source dependency capabilities, where also Rattler build, what I mentioned before, is going to play a big role. Because the idea is that you can also run Pixie build at some point soon, and that would build you a Gonda package out of your Pixie project. But we would use the same capabilities to basically uh, also allow you to get local dependencies, um, and then build them ad hoc and put them into your environment. Yeah, so yeah, I so suppose that, it's probably... Oh, go ahead, Ruben, sorry. Yeah, so that comes back to the example you gave before with uh, the problem that there's a huge zero day bug or something, and you would want to use a non-support... Uh, yeah, a version that's not uh, shared around the world yet, so you need this uh, GitHub uh, link and that package you need to install, and that's something we still want to support through this uh, local or URL-based uh, dependency. Uh, but right. for that, kind of like need to be able to build it. Yeah, kind of like the Git plus on pip install. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. All right, I, I found out where this little uh, section was here, where this uh, Pixie is made for collaboration on your announcement, where it just says Git clone some repo, Pixie run, start build, whatever. Um, yeah. This, this is pretty, maybe just talk through like what happens there, because if I don't even have Python, 
much less a virtual environment, much less the things installed. You know, if I try this at Python, if I they just say clone this, go here, Python run. Like if you don't have Python, it'll just say Python, what is that? If you do have Python, it'll say, you know, fast API, what is that? <laughs> right? Like there's a lot of yeah. steps. Uh, that this really simplifies, and that's kind of what I was talking about with the beginners as well. Like, you know, maybe speak to what's happening here. Yeah. So when you do Pixie Run, it will create, and you have nothing on your system, right, except for Pixie and that repository. Um, then it's going to create a hidden folder inside of your project that's called .pixie and in there, it will install all of these tools that are dependencies of the project. So Python, NumPy, scikit-learn, whatever. And uh, that, uh, like, and then when you do Pixie Run, it will invoke. Actually, there's a thing called Dino Task Share, which we're using, um, and that's basically something. Like, it looks like Bash, but it also works in Windows, which is like the key feature here. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> So that will sort of run the task. And uh, in this case, like some task is probably defined inside of the Pixie Tommel. And that might run something like Python, I don't know, start Flask or uh, start Jupyter or, you know, whatever mm -hmm. uh, the developer desires to do. Um, but yeah, like the, the cool thing is that it will, it, like in the background, activate the environment, like the virtual environment and use it to run your software. Okay. Yeah, that's really cool. And that, yeah, most of that kind of happens behind the scenes. So also with Conda, for example, or Mamba, it's usually multiple uh, steps. So usually what you would do is you do like Mamba create uh, my environment and then you, that environment would have some name and then you would need to do Mamba activate my environment. And then, uh, then only you would be able to run stuff and what you are running is also probably going to look more complicated than just typing pixie run some task, which does all of that. Right. The, the some task is almost an alias for the actual run command, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It could be something very complicated. And it could also be multiple tasks that they actually run in the background because they can yes. depend on each other. Excellent. I really like that the virtual environment or all the, the binary configuration stuff is a sub directory of the project. That's always bothered me about Conda. You know, if I go, if I've got, I, know, I think I have about 260 GitHub repos on my, my GitHub profile and I check out other people's stuff and check it out. And so if I go just to my file system and I go in there, I'm like, I haven't messed with this for a year. Was that on the old computer? Is on my laptop? Is on my mini? Like what, what was that on? I, yeah. I don't, so it, it could be, I haven't set it up or maybe I have, right? And if I go there and I see there's a, a VNV folder or something along those lines, I'm like, oh, yeah, it might be out of date, but I definitely have done something with this here. I probably can run it. Whereas the Conda style, like, you don't know. What did you name it? Yeah. If you have 200 of them, yeah. what are what is the right one? How do I activate it? And then also, if something kind of goes haywire, it's like, you know, what? I'm just going to RMRF <laughs> that that folder and it's it's out. Just, just recreate it on the new version of whatever, right? But if it's somewhere else, you know, there's just like this this disconnect. It's, I know there's like a command flag to override or something to like get Conda to put it locally, but defaults are powerful, right? And I really like that it's it's like there and you can just blast away the dot pixie and, you know, yep. start over if you need to. And and we're also using the same tricks that Conda uses and a bunch of other package managers. So like if you can have these multiple environments, but they actually share the underlying files, so if you mm -hmm. use the same Python 3.11 version in multiple environments, it's not yeah, like you don't duplicate those files. You don't lose a lot of storage, for example. Oh, that's nice. And, and the other thing that's really cool, and I mean, Conda also gives you that, but you can have completely different Python versions in all of these environments. And it's uh, it's very like straightforward to use. Like you don't need to like, I don't know, run it through containers or stuff like that. It's just like all in your system and uh, yeah, very nice. Yeah. And actually, excellent. Yeah, yeah. Oops. Let's see what else I want to. <laughs> yeah. So one thing that I ran across here that was pretty interesting, while um, just researching this, is you said, um, Pixie and Conda, like Nix, are language agnostics. And I'm like, what is this Nix thing? Yeah. Uh, and that brought me over to Nix OS. What is what is this? 
Um, Nix or yeah, Nix basically is a functional package manager. Okay. So uh, it works with a functional programming language, which is kind of an interesting idea. And uh, a lot of people that know Nix uh, really love it. So we would like for Pixie to also be as loved as Nix is by Nix people. <laughs> Um, and uh, basically, uh, what's nice about uh, functional programming language is that it um, kind of, you know, from the input, the output, so you can cache the function execution and you know, okay, uh, like if the function didn't change and the inputs didn't change, then the output is also not going to change. Right. You can cache the heck out of it. You can parallelize it so yeah. much and so on. Yeah. And that's kind of what, like, that's how I understand Nix is that basically uh, you have a function that you execute to, let's say, get bash on your system or get Python on your system. And once you have executed that function for that specific Python version, you know that you have, you know, Python with that hash in your system somewhere. And then Nix has some magic to kind of string things together so that uh, you can also sort of do something like a conda activate where it would um, put the right version of Python NumPy and whatever you install through Nix onto your like system path and make it usable. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think Nix and Pixie are competitors in a way. Uh, the, the thing about the functional language is that it also makes it like way less beginner friendly, at least that's kind of my opinion. And yeah, I agree. Uh, the way Pixie kind of works is like really straightforward in a way. Like you just define your dependencies and ranges and stuff and you get the binaries with Nix. Sometimes you need to like, usually you build things from source. So that's also a difference. Uh, I think they have like distributed caches that you could use and things like that. But uh, honestly, I'm not a user of Nix, so I'm not sure how, how widely these caches, like widely used these caches sure. are. But um, uh, we definitely look at Nix as like also another source of like inspiration and I, I'm, I think they have something really good going for them because people that use Nix, they are like super evangelical about it. And, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, it also probably helps its functional programming, right? People who do yeah. functional programming, like they, they love yeah, functional the programming. <laughs> the, pureness, sure. the pureness of it is pretty, is pretty nice. And then Nix OS also goes like a step further where you can sort of manage your entire like configuration and everything through, through the same system. And that's also pretty powerful. And uh, maybe maybe we can find some interesting ways of like supporting something similar. But in a way, like if you look at Pixie, I think we are trying to like we don't actually care so much about Conda in a way, or like maybe that's also the wrong way to put it. But uh, but basically, what we're looking is also like uh, how does Docker do things, and how does Nix do things, and like how can we kind of like learn from those tools and uh, yeah, we yeah. have a pretty well-defined vision for ourselves. And the main part is that we just want to make it easy to get started. So you you shouldn't have the hassle of learning a new thing to get started. You should just know like the bare minimum of information on how to run something. And Pixie is there to help you. Instead of we do something like with a complete vision that's making it perfect. And we're even doing it in the specific OS that you need to install. We want this to be used on every OS and we want this to be used by everyone so you can share your code with anyone, anywhere. Yeah. That's something the, we really focus the, on. The clone, sure, the clone and then just Pixie run. That's that's pretty easy. It's pretty easy for people to do, right? <laughs> I, would, I would say so. Yeah. So that's the experience if someone's set up a project for you. Uh, on your announcement post, you'll have a nice little example of <laughs> not a terribly complicated <laughs> example of a, an app that you might or a project you set up but maybe just talk through like if if i want to start with just maybe i have a github repo already but i yeah. haven't set it like what's the process there so you would uh, if you already have a github repository for example you would just do pixie init and then give it yeah basically you would just say dot because that's your current folder or mm -hmm. if you don't have anything, you would just do something like Pixit any my project. And that will create the my project folder for you with a pixie.toml file inside. And then once you have that, you can do pixie add uh, 
Python and you can use uh, like the specifiers from Conda. So you could do something like Python, Python equals 3.11 and that would get you Python 3.11 into mm -hmm. the dependencies of that project. And then when you, and it also installs it at that point. And after it installs, it creates that log file that you can also like should check into your repository so that you know what the latest versions were that were like working, yeah working yeah project. okay like the pinned basically the pinned versions yeah. or constraints yeah basically yeah one other thing that happens when you do pixie add is that it actually goes and tries to figure out like what's the latest version that's available for that package and then already puts a pin into your dependencies mm -hmm. so what we see on the screen is like we do pixie add cowpie and then it adds cowpie 1.1.5 dot star so that's a pretty specific version already Nice. And you haven't done it here, but so the example is pixie run cow pie and then the parameter is hello blog reader and it like does the, the cow <laughs> saying hello blog reader. Yeah. But when you talked earlier about the the tasks or whatever, you could just say create a task called cow and it is Python cow pie hello blog reader, right? And that you would just yeah. say pixie run cow and the same thing would happen. Is that, do I got that yeah, all put so, together right? Yep, yep, yep. That's That's absolutely the case. And, uh, but basically everything, any binary executable that you have in your environment, like in this case, cowpy, you can also call with pixie run, whatever. Like, so you could also right. do pixie run Python and it would start Python 3.11 or whatever you have installed inside of that environment. Okay. Yeah. And that would actually do the REPL and everything. Yeah. 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 Just like uh, having it globally installed. So one thing so, that does, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so one other feature of Pixie that we haven't mentioned before is uh, that you can still do global installs. So sometimes you have that command line tool that you really love. Uh, one of the things that we I usually install is bat, which is like cat with wings. <laughs> uh, and so what you can do with Pixie is you can do Pixie global install bat, and that will install bat and make it globally available. So you can run it from wherever. It's not tied to any like project environment. It's just on your system in your home folder essentially and uh, you can just run bat wherever you are and it works yeah the one that comes to mind for me a lot is um pipx yeah is, is one exactly of them where we got this uh kind of it's using similar mechanisms to that so okay. every tool that you install this way uh um is installed into its own virtual environment so they don't have any overlap you can install uh versions that are completely unrelated right maybe even the different pythons right yeah 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 hey wolf i think you might be a little farther away from your mic than you were oh, before sorry. if you <laughs> yeah no it just no cha worries. changes changes the, the volume yeah. a little yeah no worries um sorry. what one thing that i also like a lot about this and you know pour one out for poor old pep something something <laughs> something about the dunder um Pi packages folder. I can't remember what the pep number is, but basically the the idea that if I'm just in the right place, the the run command should grab whatever local environment is the one I've set up, rather than explicitly going finding the environment, activating the environment, etc. So it looks like when you say pixie run, there's no pixie activate or any of those things, right? How's that work? Yeah. So like. The way Conda environments work is that you need to have some sort of like little activation thing where basically the past variable environment variable is changed and adjusted um, and some other activation scripts are run. And with Pixie, what we're doing is we run those in the background and then we extract all the environment variables that are necessary for, for the mm -hmm. activation basically to work. Uh, and then we uh, just inject it right before we execute uh, what you want to execute, like Calpi in this case. Yeah, yeah. so there's like an um, implicit activate, or you don't even have to say activate in, in Python. You can just, if you just use that Python, you say yeah. the path to the, the virtual environment Python run, that like that's sufficient, yeah? Yeah, that that's more or less what happens. Like, yeah. uh, my, like sometimes, you know, packages can have different requirements when it comes to activation. So like Python yeah. doesn't have many requirements when it comes to activation, but some other packages, they... They might need some other like environment variables that are specific to the environment location where they are installed, et cetera. Sure. And well, uh, even Python virtual environments can get weird where like you can set yeah. environment variables that get set during <laughs> the activation of the virtual environment, right? Like I don't yeah. think many people do that because it's transient, but it could. We 
We also have a pixie shell command. So if you want to have that experience of like an activated environment, I you see. can use pixie shell and then it is like basically a shell that acts like an activated environment. Like poetry has the same. And many yeah, ways. sure. When now the example here shows like I'm in the top level of the project and I say pixie run. What if I'm like three directories down and I say pixie <laughs> run, what happens then? <laughs> Yeah, then the exact same thing will happen because Pixie runs from the root of the project and okay. uh, all your tasks are by default running from the root of the project. So you define them uh, with the path in your project as they are always. And then where you are, you can run those tasks um, uh, as they are. But if you want to run something in that directory, you can just use Pixie run and then your own commands to, to, to right. act on that directory. Um, there's this other way of using it, like the Pixie itself will run down the uh, the path that you're in and will find the, the first Pixie project that it encounters. And for instance, Pixie itself has some examples. So if you move into the examples directory and then in one of the examples, those are their own Pixie project. So if you run it there, Pixie run start, it will start the example instead of the interesting so you could have a nested one like there's a, a main one yep. but then inside you could have little sub pixie projects yeah a there's little bit just... like node and npm in that regard yeah yep. we we have an issue that's open about mono repo support and yeah so i was gonna say this sounds that, like so, yeah. yeah this sounds like a really good idea for mono repo support <laughs> yeah so, so there, there's, there's yeah there's a different problem that you normally with monorepos have some uh, shared dependencies. So um, if you, for instance, have in your, your, your root of your repository, you have Python uh, dependency defined, then you want that shared between all the packages uh, yeah, down in your uh, yeah. repo tree. So uh, that's something we still have to support. So right now there are like actual separate projects and the, the Pixie tool will just find the first projects it encounters, but we need some kind of way to define a workspace or monorepo, if you mm -hmm. would say it like that. And then you could like link those environments together. And if you start a, a lower level one, you would start the, the main one uh, with it or something like that. Got it. Or look, look at the dependencies of the top one, and then you might add some more in your little sub project type exactly. of thing, something like that. Well, even what you already have sounds pretty excellent for it. Yeah. So currently, if you have like a system where you have a, a backend server that's completely Python or Rust or whatever, you could have that as a separate project and then have a, another project that is like the front end. So you do some, you, know, you install NPM there or whatever. And, uh, those are completely separate within your repository. And the main repository is just some tooling to, uh, for instance, uh, lint everything or, or or something like that, or install your base uh, dependencies that you want to use in the, in the complete repository. But uh, you could already split it up pretty nicely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I'm sure if you have a, a true a truly large organization with the mono repo, which for people who don't know, that just means like all the code for the whole organization is in one huge repository instead of a bunch of projects with dependencies across projects. It's just within that kind of that file structure. Like it's a lot. I was complaining about having a dependency that had two things that wanted the same library, both lower than and greater than some version number. Like, that's for one project, <laughs> you know what I mean? You put it all together, it's only going to get more challenging. So tools like this, uh, these sub projects and stuff, I think could help go like, all right, this part needs these things because that's the data science part. This other part needs that thing because that's the microservice part. Yeah, exactly. Nice. So what else should people know about uh, Pixie? Um, Taking yeah, think, taking dependency uh, taking PR uh, PRs and contributions, definitely. Like uh, we're also still like pretty early, so we love people that test Pixie and tell us the feedback on like our Discord channel or on like GitHub. I think we have discussions open as well and issues. Um, any feedback is appreciated. 
uh, and we're really like trying to take package management to the next level that includes like building packages that includes like package signing stuff like mm -hmm. this security etc um there are so many things and issues to work on and i think it's going to be very fun yeah i'm I also actually organizing packaging con uh, okay that's uh, happening in like uh, a week from now actually and really looking forward to that so that's going to be fun to chat awesome. with a lot of other does it have an developers. online component yeah virtual so it's uh, in berlin but it's also hybrid so mm -hmm. you can join virtually if you want will the videos be on some something like youtube later yep yep for sure okay cool if the timing lines up you'll have to give me the link to the videos and i'll, I'll put it <laughs> into the show yeah. notes for people like it we yeah, might somehow miss like the conference runs but the, yeah. the videos aren't yet up but if they are you know send me a link and we'll make it part yeah. of the show so people can check it out and one of prefix uh, bus will also talk about uh, this these rust crates that we've been building and how how it all fits together if you want to learn more about that and if you want to contribute like also, if you want to learn Rust, like we're more than happy to kind of like help you, like guide you, uh, as time permits, obviously. But um, mm -hmm. we yeah, we're uh, trying to be really active on our uh, on our uh, channels. So on GitHub, we have some good first issues, and if you have some questions, just ask around. And in our Discord, we're very active and really try to react as fast as possible to uh, nice uh, to anything. Right at the bottom of prefix.dev, you've got your little Discord icon yep. uh, down there so people can click on that to, to kind of be part of it right i think it's right to letter it uh, yeah <laughs> it's little i see that you yeah i see you all both are like me and have like oh, decided yeah, not accepted that that x twitter <laughs> is called x <laughs> yeah I, uh, i'm, I'm not changing to mine <laughs> They should come out with the final logo, right? Like that's oh my God. that can't be it. I can't be it. It's like a child <laughs> drew it. Like I'm just this is this is what I got and it's there. Maybe I need I should probably put an EX Twitter in there just for <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um yeah. And then a quick question from Elliot's um any meaning behind the name Pixie? <laughs> we thought very long about the name. Uh we had a bunch of different versions like uh initially we thought px just p and x mm -hmm. uh but have you considered x i hear you just use that for whatever ah. <laughs> just kidding sorry but back to twitter for a second is, right. uh, burnt. <laughs> it is burnt. uh we also <laughs> thought about packs like p a x but that's apparently uh executable that you already have on your system if you're using linux or mac so oh, that didn't that'd be work tricky and yeah. tab completion is broken and all of that mm. um we thought about p E X, I don't know. Like it, it, we wanted to derive it a little bit from the name prefix because that's kind of the company name. Um, but Pixie seem, seemed really cool because it's a, apparently a magical fairy, and we yeah. make a package <laughs> management ma magic. Yeah, exactly. So, it's, I think the name is great. Yeah. It's short enough to type. Yes. It's it's pretty unique. Exactly. You can it's somewhat Googleable, right? Yeah, yeah and you can um, pronounce well, it. Yeah, that was yeah. also important to it. Yeah. You don't have and, to uh, debate. Is it Pi Pi or is it Pi Pi? Like, let's say, you know, like, there's, yeah. make it lowercase. It's not an acronym. You don't say the letters. And before, like, uh, I, I, we created this thing called Micromamba, which I don't want to, like, go into too much detail, but a lot of people complained about Micromamba being too long to type. So we had to stay under the five character limit. <laughs> yeah, I think there's there's <laughs> value in that. Yeah. There's definitely value in that. So let's close out our conversation with uh, where you all are headed. What's next? Yeah, like we are super excited about a bunch of upcoming features. Uh, one is definitely what I already mentioned, Pixie Build, so that you can build uh, packages right away from Pixie. Um, source, to prepare them uh, for depend... Conda Forge, right? Well, for Conda Forge, or like maybe you also have some internal stuff or your own private okay. things and stuff. Um, and we just want to make that easy because mm -hmm. that is currently way too hard to like make a conda package is like a bunch of steps um and uh, that also kind of precludes that you could uh, use source and git dependencies for, for like other pixie projects because basically what we do what we will do in the background is like if you 
depend on a source dependency for another Pixie project, we will build it into a like package on the fly and then put it into your environment. Um, and then like integrating with uh, the PyPI ecosystem, that's what we're actually working on the most right now. Um, and that is the RIP thing that I told told you about. Yeah, that's uh, because awesome. Because we just see a lot of need in the community to have this. Uh, a lot of, um, yeah, projects yeah, in the if, wild if, are kind of mixing it. Yeah, if you get it working with PyPI, I will switch my stuff over awesome. and give it give it a try and see how it works. So, that would but be great. until yeah. then, I can't. Right, I've just got I've got like hundreds of packages, and a lot of them I'm sure yeah. are just unique to PyPI. Yeah. So um, we I we are not far away like i think the the hard bits are solved and that was like resolving because it works quite different from from conda you need to like get the individual wheel files to get the metadata etc and like that doesn't scale if you need all the metadata up front which is actually the case in conda you have all the metadata up front but with PyPI you don't and so we had to make the server lazy we had to make the server generic and we are through that process now um and now it's basically just engineering work in that sense to to integrate it with pixie but it's going to happen and it's going to be nice, I'm sure. Um, yeah, we also have some ideas of like, can we somehow um, merge Pixie Tommel into PyProject Tommel so that it's like more natural to like Python developers and you only need to manage one yeah. file. And I think PyProject Tommel gives us the flexibility that we would need to do I that. I think it does. You've got things like Hatch and others yeah. that they've kind of got a way to go in there. Yeah. And then we have some other ideas that are a bit more out there maybe, but, uh, or not really, but like we already have a setup pixie action for GitHub. That's, that's, that's really nice. Um, and, uh, then another idea is like, how, how can you go from a virtual environment to a Docker image easily? Um, so that's also something that we're thinking about. Okay. These kind of things, but yeah, yeah all very, all very exciting. Awesome. How long has this been around? I your blog post is two months old. It's uh, <laughs> announcing this stuff. So, yeah, I mean, I think we maybe made the repository public um, months earlier than the blog post or so. But uh, it, like Prefix as a company, is uh, like a, just very little over a year old, and that's when we like really started to build the website, the platform, Pixie, Rattler, and all of these things. So. I think yeah. Pixie, we saw that maybe like five months ago, let's say. So not too old, still very fresh. Yeah, yeah, it still has that, that new software smell. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, I hope we don't get the, uh, yeah, like... Um, the old and moldy smell. Know how to, yeah. You don't want that. <laughs> but still, yeah, like, so personally, I'm very surprised how, how stable it is already. And I think that's partly due to the use of Rust and uh, the fact that we can very heavily check some of the inner workings of the tool before we mm -hmm. ship it. Yeah. yeah. Well, it looks like it's off to a really good start. I like a lot of the ideas here. So yeah, keep up cool. the good work. Before Thanks. before we wrap it up, we're basically out of time, but you know, I'm there's the always the open source dream of I'm gonna build a project it's going to get super popular. Um, the dream used to be, I'm going to do some consulting around it, right? I've created Project X. Project X is popular, so I can charge high consulting rates. That's the dream of the 90s. I think the new dream is, <laughs> I'm going to start a company around my project and and have some kind of open core model and something interesting there. Um, you guys have prefix.dev. What's what's the dream for you? Like, how, what's your, how are you approaching this? I think a ton of people would be interested to just hear, like, how yeah. did you make that happen? You know. So you saved the hardest question for last. <laughs> and, <laughs> and you don't have to answer it, but I do think it's, it's no, interesting. It yeah. <laughs> um, I think package management is a hard problem, and there are, there are lots of sort of sub problems that. Um, I would say enterprise customers in a way are willing to pay for. Um, that includes like security, uh, sure. like managed repositories, let's say, like uh, basically Red Hat's and like more or less Red Hat's project product is that they have this like, I don't know, five or 10 years or something like of support for like old versions of packages 
for enterprise customers. And um, I think we have a pretty interesting approach to package management that is pretty easy to kind of grasp. Uh, and like part of why we want to make Pixie build uh, a thing is also because we want people to make more packages and then upload them to our website and kind of grow this entire thing in popularity and um, make it super useful so that uh, we hopefully end up with customers that are supporting our work. Awesome. Well, good luck to both of you. And thanks for being <laughs> on the show to share what you're up to. Sure. Thank you. Yep. yep. Bye, y'all. Nice.